Well, good evening. It's uh, good to see uh, each of you here with us uh, this evening. We're glad that you've chosen to come and to uh, worship with us. I am thankful uh, for the invitation and for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, this evening. It's always bittersweet uh, for me to have this opportunity, and I will forever be uh, grateful, uh, thankful for the opportunity that my family had uh, to serve here uh, with you. Uh, it was a special uh, time in our lives, and I will always be grateful for it. Uh, this is a special family, a unique congregation, and a very talented uh, congregation. I thought before, there is, really isn't much we can't do. You want to build a house? We've got guys that can build a house. You need somebody to weld something? We've got someone who can weld something. We've got school teachers. We've got people who've been in the banking industry. We've got people that are in the medical field. To be out in such a small place is really a unique place. Very, uh, a lot of really talented uh, group of people here. But beyond all of those things, I think what strikes me most is the sincerity of people's hearts wanting to do what is right. And so I'm grateful to be affiliated with this congregation and thankful for it. The theme that has been selected for this summer series is who is the Christ? And, and certainly that is a, a good topic. And I think it's one that we can uh, all benefit from. The more that we understand Christ, the more that we understand about him and who he is and the work that he has done, the more that we can become like him, the more that we can look like him. And ultimately, that ought to be the goal for each of us. We ought to seek in, in our lives to look like Christ. And I think we ought to not just seek it because it's a good thing. I think that we're obligated as Christians, as children of God, to seek to conform ourselves into his image. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, Paul would say, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, right? He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And so God expects of us to be seeking to conform ourselves into the image of his son, but that requires something of us. It requires that we know him. You cannot conform to the image of the son of God if you do not know who the son of God is. And so as we think about this series of lessons, who is the Christ, I think that it will help us. It will help us to conform more to the image of the son of God as we learn more about who he is and what he has done for us. And so tonight we're going to look at Jesus as the Savior of the world. I think that's an interesting uh, topic, uh, this idea of a Savior, sort of an idea of a hero, if you will. I think for some reason or another we're fascinated by that concept of a Savior. In fact, if you look at Hollywood, I would say they make millions or billions of dollars a year on this concept of a savior. And the concept is this. You have somebody or maybe a group of people who are in a negative situation. You have somebody who needs some help. Maybe it's a fire. Maybe it's a wreck. Maybe they're being kidnapped or they're being mugged or they're homeless, they're jobless, or they're sick or whatever the case is. They're in a negative situation. And they want to be removed from that negative situation. So here comes somebody, sort of a savior or a hero, and he comes along and he removes that person from that negative situation and moves them into a positive situation. And that's something that I think that we, we like. We like it so much that we continue to go watch the same storyline over and over and over again. We spend the same money, we spend all this money to watch the same thing. You've got someone who uh, is in a less than an ideal situation and somebody comes to save the day. We like that. I think we like that idea of a savior concept for a couple of reasons. I think one is I think that we can all identify with that need or that desire to be rescued. And I think that the older you get, probably the more that you can uh, attach some feelings with that. I just want to be rescued. I want to be removed. I want somebody to come along and to help me. And so we can identify with that. But I also think that there's the other side of that sometimes where we want to be the hero. You know, we think we could have saved those people, right? You know, so it gives us those feelings like, you know, hey, we could have done that. Had we been there, you know? 
Maybe your thought about the plane being hijacked and you just thought, had I been there, right? Maybe you've had those thoughts, maybe not I've had, you know, hey. Sometimes those flights are long, you know, 12 hours. What are you going to do? Think about ways that you could save everybody on the plane, be the hero. But we do enjoy that sort of stuff, right? We can uh, sympathize with those who are in need because we have been in need. And we can also uh, appreciate that idea of one who goes beyond and seeks to save. And so with that concept in mind, I want to take your uh, your thoughts spiritually for just a few moments. And I want us to talk about, well, who is the Christ? Well, who is the Christ? Well, he is the Savior of the world. And again, according to the concept, there must be something negative. Something negative must transpire, and there also must be something good. Now, when it comes to this, the spiritual side, I think we all know what the negative is. And there's three things on a grand scale that we're aware of. Sin separation from God and death. Those three things are huge things and are negative things that each one of us have in our life. Sin. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, sins. Isaiah 59 and verse 2, behold your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death has spread to all men. And he says, why? Because all have, all have sinned. Of course, Romans 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. And so that is the situation that is outside of Christ. And so when you look at that situation, it is a very negative situation. It is a situation that is full of doom and gloom. There is no hope outside of Christ. There is no peace outside of Christ. And so when you look at that situation, what you're seeing is a hopeless situation. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do in and of ourselves to rectify that situation. We need a Savior. We need some help. We need someone to come along and to rescue us. And Jesus is the one that will do that. He is the one that will offer us forgiveness, and he is the one that will set the path of forgiveness so that we can stand before God and we can have hope again. John 3, verse 16 and verse 17. So he takes us from the negative into the positive. For God so loved the world, and he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son to condemn the world, but in order that the world would be saved through him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18, God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. Romans 6 and verse 23, we looked at the first part just a minute ago. At the end of that verse says, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, Jesus is the Savior of the world. He takes us from all of the negative. He takes us from the sin. He takes us from the separation and he takes us from death and he saves us. And in that safe condition, we are now at peace with God. We have no fear of death because we know as his children that we have eternal life. That's a comforting thought. But I'll say to all of this, what a magnificent reality. What a magnificent reality, what a blessing, and what a privilege it is to be part of that, for us to have a Savior such as that. Now, me for sure, we have a part to play, and we're going to come back to that at the end of the sermon. But at this point, I just want you to stop for just a moment and really take in everything that our Savior has done for each of us. Think about the sins, think about the separations, Think about all the negative things that have happened in your life. And then think about all the positives that come because of Jesus. What a blessing. Now at this point in the lesson, as you think about Jesus, as you think about him being our Savior and what he saved us from, I want to uh, switch gears for just a few minutes. I want us to go over to 
uh, the book of John chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, open um, them up to John chapter 4. And it's actually in John chapter 4 that we find this phrase. And so we're going to spend some time over there in John 4. In John chapter 4, we find that phrase, Jesus, the Savior of the world. John chapter 4, and the story that we're going to look at is a very well-known story. Uh, you know the story uh, just as well as I know the story. And it's one that we uh, preach from often because it's, it's just a great section of passage to preach from. It's the Samaritan woman at the well. And, and if you remember that story... And the setup of the story, you know that that woman was in a negative situation. It was not great for her. If you remember, her life seems to be a mess morally. And then when it comes to the religious side of her, she was also confused as well. So look, uh, let's look at uh, John chapter 4. We're going to read verse 14 uh, through uh, 26. John chapter 4, verse 16 through 26. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming, and neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And so you see her life. It's a mess, right? Jesus says, Call your husband. And she's, you know, and it mentions to her that she's had five husbands. And he says that the one that you have now is not your husband. And so spiritually speaking, she and morally speaking, uh, she's got some problems. But not only does she have those moral problems, she's also confused spiritually. She is confused about where to worship. She is confused on where the Messiah is and who Jesus is. I've got a water over there. There's someone, I think it's right behind you, Don. I drank a monster and ate some peanut butter, and uh, I'm just not going to make it if I get some water. Thank you. We're just have to cut it. All right, so what I want you to see, though, is really the comment or the statement that Jesus makes to her in that confusion. He makes a declaration, 25 and 26. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I am he who, or I, I who speak to you am he. Who is the Christ? Jesus says right here, that's me. I'm the Christ, I'm the Messiah, I'm the anointed one. I am the chosen one of God. And I believe that this declaration, the statement that was made to her in this moment changed her life forever. Now drop down to verse 28, and we're going to read through verse 30. 28. And so the woman left the water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. All right, drop down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So the Samaritans came to him and they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we have believed. For we have heard for ourselves. 
And we know that this is indeed, notice this, the Savior of the world. And so what we have here is a group of people who have come to believe in Jesus. It first started with this woman. And then she went into town and she began to tell everything that had happened to her and others started to believe. But as they came out, they began to speak with Jesus and they convinced Jesus to stay with them for two days. And then after they spent two days with Jesus, I want you to notice what they said in verse 42. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. I'm going to suggest to you that's an amazing statement. And what a declaration from a group of people who should not have been making that statement at that moment. It should have been somebody else. It should have been the Jews. But these people had enough knowledge and they had enough um, humility about themselves to be able to submit to the Savior and say, yes, indeed. After listening to Jesus, yes, indeed, this is the Messiah. Yes, indeed, this is the Savior of the world. They figured out what so many of the Jews could not figure out or would not figure out. Now watch this. Their belief in Jesus as the Messiah and ultimately the Savior of the world was purely based on evidence. Purely based on evidence. For the woman, it was the fact that Jesus had told her things that nobody else knew. And so she looked at Jesus and she knew something was different. There was a miraculous event that was taking place and she understood that that pointed to something. We're going to come back to miracles in just a minute, but miracles were a sign. She understood it was a sign and that pointed to something. Of course, it pointed to the fact that it's the Son of God. But for others in that story, it started with the evidence that she had submitted but soon it was the words of Jesus. The words of Jesus superseded that. They had spent two days listening to Jesus. And upon all that evidence, they said, we know. We know that this is the Savior of the world. A very emphatic statement. We know he is the Savior of the world. Can't help but think about Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the word of God. They heard the word of God. They listened to it. And they developed faith. And so when we are questioned, or when they were questioned with the same question that we are pondering tonight, who is the Christ? Their conclusion was that he's the savior of the world. Now, again, I want to reiterate this, that their conclusion was based upon evidence, based upon the fact that they'd spent two days listening to Jesus. They had weighed his words. And they had come to know that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So with all of that said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? I hope that you do. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world? Now, I'm going to follow that up with this question. What have you based your conclusion on? That's a little bit different. What have you based your conclusion on this evening? If someone were to come through this door, and maybe they grabbed you as they were coming in, and they said, you know what? I've been hearing about this Jesus. I would like you to present to me some evidence for the fact that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, could you do it? If someone walked through this door and they said, listen, I've got some questions about this man. Who is the Christ? You say he's the Savior of the world. Could you do it? Could you open up your Bible? Could you present to them the case for Christ? I might be out of line here, but I would dare say that many Christians couldn't do that. But if someone asked for the evidences, they wouldn't know what to say. A lot of us were raised in the church, and it was just sort of passed on to us, and we just sort of accepted that Jesus is the Savior, right? There's a savior of the world. That's what mom and dad have always said. And you know what? I believe it. Could you prove it? 
I don't think a lot of us could prove it. I don't think a lot of us could give evidence as to why we had faith in Jesus. Now, if you uh, cannot give evidence for your faith, how solid do you think your faith really is? And is it any wonder then why so many Christians are weak in their faith? Is it any wonder why so many are, are lukewarm? Is it any wonder why so many of us doubt our salvation? If we've never truly looked at all the evidence, and we've never really gathered that in and made a conclusion based upon the evidence, is it any wonder why so many of us are weak and doubting? You see, when it comes to faith, when it comes to Jesus, we need to intellectually come to a conclusion about who he is. And when there is a firm foundation in the identity of who Jesus is, it is then that we have the opportunity to grow in our faith and to mature our faith. But if you have no evidence in your life for who Jesus is, and you cannot present any type of evidence in your life for who Jesus is, how in the world do you think that you're going to grow your faith? If you don't have a firm foundation, how do you think that you're going to mature in the faith? If you don't have a firm foundation in who Jesus is, when this life rocks you to the core, and it will, how do you expect to stay faithful? If you don't have the evidences of who he is, it matters. It matters. Faith is intellectual. It's based on facts. And through those facts, we gain a firm foundation. You know, the Bible in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 would uh, commend the Bereans for what? Because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether or not those things that were being taught were what? Were true. They searched out the scriptures. They looked for the evidence. Before any kind of change was going to be made in their lives, they were going to know for sure that what they were going to follow was indeed the truth. They were not looking for feelings. They were looking for evidences. The Samaritans, two days with Jesus, what do you think they were looking for? They were looking for the evidences of who he was. God has never asked anyone to just believe. Never, ever. Has God ever asked someone, just believe? And the American saying of just take the leap of faith is not of God. Do not ever say those words because they're unbiblical. Just take the leap of faith. It's not a leap of faith. I've got evidence for what I believe. And if I don't have evidence for what I believe, then it's not a faith. It's not a faith. You and I have evidence. For what we believe. And in that evidence. We can build a strong foundation. So if you haven't caught one word that I've said this evening. That's, that's fine. But I want you to catch this. And you can write it down or whatever. But I want you to know this. And if you drift off to sleep afterwards. That's fine too. But know this. There is evidence for our faith. There is evidence for our faith. There's evidence for Jesus as the Savior of the world, and you need to know that. And I need to know that. So with all that said, let me give you some evidence. Now, there's not enough time uh, for all the evidence to be presented uh, of, for God and for the Bible and for who Jesus is. So we're going to do this in a very broad way. I'm going to give you some things to think about. You can take those things home and you can study them out more. But let's think about this. What is the evidence? We'll start for God. Is there evidence for God? Sure enough. I'm looking at you, and all of you are an evidence that there is a creator, and you're looking back at me, and you're seeing some other people in front of you, and all of that is evidence for what? Somebody created you. Somebody created me. 
When we look outside of these windows, we see all this nature, we see all the trees and animals, we see everything that's out there. And all of those things declare to us there is what? A God. 100%. Look at Psalm, or excuse me, Romans 1, 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Now certainly nature doesn't tell us who created us, but it does say there is a God. We can look up at the sun and the moon and the stars and we can know that there is a God. Now, again, they don't tell us anything about the identity of that God, but it does lead us down the path that there is somebody or something out there that is mightier than we are and that has created us and all the things around us. Psalms 19. Psalm 19. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. The heavens declare the glory of God. Is there evidence for a creator? Absolutely. The next thing we would have to ask, though, is there evidence for the Bible? Right? Is there evidence for the Bible? Well, I believe that there are, and we're going to mention about six of them here. Very briefly, you can write them down. You can go home and study more. You can ask Scott. Uh, Scott would love to go into all these uh, evidences. And, I, and, and, you know, for the, the classes that he's teaching on Sunday morning, these are things that are, are important, and these are things that people are going to ask. I didn't realize how many atheists there are or agnostics there are until I went to work. There's a lot of them. And they've got questions. Are there evidences for the Bible? Absolutely. There's a historical, archaeological, and scientific. And then from there, there are internal evidences as well. It's unity, the fulfillment of prophecy, and then I'm going to add this one, the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so those are some quick points of evidence for God and for the Bible. I think we have to start there. We have to start there with a lot of people. But with this audience, that's not where we need to start, because I believe we all believe that, that, that uh, God exists and that uh, the God that created the heavens and the earth is the same God who's authored and inspired this word, the Bible. And we believe it to be the word of God. So with that said, we go back to the question, well, who is the Christ? We say he's the savior of the world. How do we know that? There are a lot of evidences. I'm just going to go to the book of Acts chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, go there, Acts chapter 2. And we'll look at that briefly. It's the day of Pentecost. 50 days or so removed from the crucifixion of Christ. The Jews, they have gathered from uh, all over the world. It is the first gospel sermon that is going to be preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It is the birthday of the church, and we know that some 3,000 people are going to be baptized here in Acts chapter 2. Now again, remember, Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So does God provide proof who Jesus is? In the very first gospel sermon in Acts chapter 2, it is full of proof. Of who Jesus is. And so Peter's going to build the case for Jesus. He's going to do so with some prophecy. But I want you to remember who he's speaking to. He is speaking to a group of Christian, or excuse me, Jews. So naturally, he's going to use the Old Testament. He's going to use the Jewish scriptures. That's what they believe in, that's what they hold to, that's what they're following after. And so he begins with. Three prophecies we're going to mention. Joel chapter 2, Joel 2, 28 through 32. He'll mention Psalm 16, 8 through 11, and Psalm 110, verse 1. 
from those prophecies, he's going to make a few points. Three points. Three points that they cannot deny. And the first one is going to make a point to the miracles. In verse 23, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. The miraculous. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4, the miracles were for a sign. And what does a sign do? It points you to something. Right? We have uh, some church signs, the Gracing Church of Christ. They're blue signs and they point to something. They're pointing to this building of where we meet as a congregation. Signs point to something and the miraculous pointed to something. It pointed to Jesus. It was attested by God through those works. Now, Those things, those miraculous events, and they were miracles. They were things that transcended the laws of nature. And they proved who he was. But I want you to notice what he says, that God did through him in whose midst? In your midst. Now, the reason why this is important, and I, I, I bring this up a lot when I teach the teens, is if a man comes in here and he says, listen, I'm a, I'm a prophet from God. It says, I got a message from God. Well, how do we know that he really is a messenger from God? Well, we really don't. But if we say, he comes in, he says, listen, I'm a messenger from God. And we say, well, I need you to prove it. He says, well, go down to the graveyard with me, and I'm going to resurrect someone from the grave. But when we see that happen, what is he going to say about that individual? Something's different about him, Gerald, Right? Something that's completely different because I've never seen anybody else resurrect anybody from the grave. But when you see a man do it and then he makes the claims that he is from God, are you going to believe him? You see a man walk on water. You see a man feed the 5,000. You see a man heal. You see a man do all these miraculous events. Does it not speak to the fact that God has sent them? And he says, you've seen them. They were witnesses. They could not deny it. Again, evidence, right? He wasn't asking for a feeling. He says, here are the evidences. And then, look at verse 23 again, or and 31 and 32, the resurrection. <laughs> this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Verse 24, God raised him up, losing the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, and he has not abandoned him to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. <laughs> this Jesus, verse 32, God raised up, of whom we're all witnesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He appeared to over 500. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, he's declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection. The resurrection declares who Jesus is. It declares that he is the Messiah, that he is the Savior, and he is the Son of God. How do we know that Jesus resurrected from the grave? Well, I think one of the strongest evidences for that is how the apostles reacted before Jesus resurrected from the grave and how they reacted after Jesus resurrected from the grave. And all of this is very much different. There are people today that will die for their faith. There are people that will get in a plane and they will destroy other people and other people's lives. Right? That is for a belief. These men said we saw. Let me ask you, what did they have to gain by holding on to the resurrection story? That exception of John, right? All of them were persecuted and, and were killed as far as we know. Did they have the opportunity to say, you know what? That wasn't true. They did. But if you look at the lives of the apostles before the resurrection and after the resurrection, you'll find proof for the resurrection of, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And then the last point that he makes is verse 33, is exaltation. 
Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Those are the evidences that Peter would give for who Jesus was. They wanted to know, and he presented those evidences. And those evidences are still true today. There's one more evidence, though, that I want to present to you from this. And it's, it's been there for 2,000 years. And that's the response. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And Peter said to the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. And those who heard his word were baptized, and they were added to, uh, though, and they were added that day about three thousand souls. We know that there were more than three thousand people there, but there were three thousand people that could have objected. It's a large number of people. It's a, a, a large body of people that would present an evidence of obedience. Three thousand people could have said, "This is not true." 3,000 people could have said, listen, let's shut down the preaching of the 12 because this is false, this is fake. And he said, we saw all these miracles. No, we didn't see any of them. And we didn't see the resurrected Christ. This is all false. And they could have stopped the preaching that day. But instead, they were obedient to the truth. They were obedient to the evidence that was presented that day. And so... Their reaction stands as an evidence for who Christ is. Their obedience. Biblical faith is not a leap. It's not hoping for something that, uh, hoping that something would be true. Instead, it is based on evidence. It's based on things that are true. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. It's not a feeling and it's not a wishful hope. Jesus is indeed the Savior of the world. He rescued us from sin and death, and he restored us into a relationship with God. Now, I mentioned towards the beginning of the lesson that there's something that we have to do. I told you that we've come back to. We've already read it, but we'll read it again, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, right, the Jews that had just crucified Christ, all of that that Peter just preached to, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What did they hear? the preaching of the gospel. They heard all of those evidences about who Jesus was, and then they said uh, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Savior of the world, but you have to do your part. If you've not done that, why don't you do that today? Why don't you do that today? And if you have, let me say this, believe in that. Too many people, I've said it so many times from this pulpit, believe that Jesus can save the world, but they don't believe that Jesus can save them. One of the things I think that in my ministry that I, I spoke about more frequently than anything, privately to people, was that one topic. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, then you better believe that he's also your Savior as well. That's a solid foundation. On both of those, the only way that we know that we are saved is because the Bible tells us so. Right? It's not a feeling. Read through the book of 1 John. He'll write over and over and over again that you may know, that you may know, that you may know. Child of God, be confident in who your Savior is. Appreciate the blessing of forgiveness. Appreciate the hope that we have in Him. Build your house on that firm foundation. If you're subject to the invitation anyway, John, one of our elders will be here to receive you as we stand and as we sing.